Thank you, everybody, for being uh, with us today. My name is Patricia de Arce. I'm a, a journalist from EFE, the news agency from Spain. Uh, first of all, I would, I would like to thank the IMF and the World Bank for hosting us here today and to the sponsors of this panel, uh, ICRIC, the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation, Oxfam, the Global Initiative for Economic and Social Rights, Latindad, and Red de Justicia Fiscal de América Latina y el Caribe. As everybody knows, since the pandemic, Latin America and the world have been living with all kinds of crises, and now we are in the middle of the cost of living crisis provoked by many factors, war in Ukraine, disruptions in the supply chain, and high inflation. Uh, it's in moments like this when countries have to be prepared to have enough uh, resources to help their economies and their citizens to get through this. There are many ways to do it, and we are talking about some of these ways. So it's a great pleasure to have with us today Jose Antonio Campo, Minister of Finance from Colombia, Claudia Sanueza, Under Secretary Ministry of Finance from Chile, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, a Nobel laureate in economics, professor at Columbia University. He's now co chair of ECRICT and he knows the house well because he's a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank. Gabriela Butcher, executive director of Oxfam, and Ilan Goldfan, Western Hemisphere director of the Western Hemisphere here in the IMF. So let's start with Minister Ocampo. Right now, Colombia is in the process of a very ambitious uh, tax reform. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong with the figures, but that would raise about uh, approximately 22 trillion pesos, about 4.7 billion dollars. You expect to get that money by increasing taxes to the wealthy, capital gains, fighting tax evasion, among other measures. What made Colombia take this direction, and what would be the use for these new revenues? How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, at the beginning, five minutes, if you can. I'm, I'm going to put the... <laughs> no, okay. it's fine. No, let me, uh, in the case of Colombia, uh, let me start by saying that um, uh, we have a, the dual cha challenge of, a, a, of a fiscal adjustment. Uh, we, we have a, a fiscal rule, which was actually, uh, we came second in Latin America after Chile in the sign of fiscal rule uh, that you know, uh, try, uh, guarantees uh, the long-term sustainability of public sector finances uh, a, a, with adjustment for economic activity on the price of oil, the price of copper in the case of Chile. Uh, uh, and uh, according to that rule, which had been suspended during the pandemic, but has, uh, has started again next year, we have to make a, a, a significant fiscal adjustment, let's say, uh, about three percentage points of GDP. Uh, reduction of the public sector deficit. Now, uh, but on top of that, there are the social demands, uh, the major social demands that uh, of the country that were reflected in the popular uh, uh, protest last year uh, and in the elections. Uh, the, the president who won uh, is, a, is in a, a pro-social uh, reform. So the, the mix of the two is that uh, led us to, uh, to promote this uh, tax reform uh, and I pre let me emphasize three elements. The, uh, the first one is the, uh, the uh, 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 you know, eliminated, uh, eliminating a lot of tax uh, benefits uh, for the uh, higher income uh, people, the personal income tax, uh, uh, but also a loss of benefits for uh, specific sectors in the business uh, tax that, that we have, and a wealth tax. Um, Colombia has a long tradition of a wealth tax, but the, uh, so we're, uh, again, introducing a wealth tax uh, on personal incomes, on personal wealth, let's say. Uh, the second is a windfall tax on uh, uh, oil and, and gas, uh, as, as I presented uh, in uh, Colombian debates. Uh, wh whenever we had a, a coffee boom in the past, the coffee sector contributed uh, in addition to the government. So I say now the boom is uh, of our coal and, uh, uh, and, and gas, it's gonna be uh, oil and gas, uh, oil and coal <laughs> uh, exports of Colombia, gas we are uh, only self-sufficient, let's say, and, uh, 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 and so therefore those two sectors uh, have to make a special contribution uh, to finance social spending. 
Uh, and the third is reducing uh, uh, tax evasion, uh, which is very high in Colombia, and, uh, it, it, and it goes together with the uh, uh, with improving the tax administration. Uh, so those are the uh, the three very in terms of revenues uh, uh, we expect the the windfall tax will be more important initially uh, but declining through time as we expect the oil and coal prices to fall so the uh, so it's basically 2023 and then the the tax rates uh, for uh, for uh, oil and gas will will decline uh, uh, and at the same time the other the the other elements of the tax reform uh, which are also gradual uh, so for example the wealth tax uh, basic, basically, the evaluation of wealth, uh, the, how the people estimate wealth for tax purposes, uh, will be a gradual process. So, uh, so that they will come gradually, together with uh, elimination of some of the benefits, will are also gradual. Uh, so uh, that will be more important. And then, the, uh, of course, uh, with improvements in tax administration, the the tax uh, uh, the tax uh, 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 benefits will start to, to decline. Now, le, le, let me, um, uh, or the tax evasion will, will start to decline. Uh, uh, now, now, let me, uh, perhaps, uh, since we are in an ECRIC meeting, uh, emphasize uh, some elements that Colombia uh, uh, supported in the Group of 24 uh, statement. Uh, uh, actually, the statement there is, uh, uh, was presented by Colombia, uh, uh, which actually is to improve the, uh, the OECD um, uh, agreement from last year. Uh, which, uh, in in our view and the view of ICRIC also, uh, since I was also the chair of ICRIC <laughs> until I became finance minister, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the benefits for uh, for uh, developing countries are minimal. Uh, so so there has to be a new round of negotiations that will improve significantly the the benefit for developing countries. Uh, at the same time, that they make it uh, the current system more uh, uh, easier to uh, to manage. Uh, because it's very complex for, for countries to, to adopt that system. Huh? Uh, for the, uh, the, so the, um, the, uh, the, the, the current system is very weak, and some of the countries that are implementing some of the policies, uh, including the U.S., uh, have adopted so many exceptions uh, that the, uh, the benefits are, are going to be uh, uh, very small. So for us, it's important to, uh, to push new negotiations. That's what uh, we uh, stated uh, in our report. You can say also, by the way, uh, the other recommendations of ICRIC, which are not here, could be uh, adopted. For example, a, 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 a tax uh, agreement in the UN, uh, which is a policy that we have been recommending in ICRIC for a long time, can be as well as some regional agreements. So we hope, I hope to be able to, to push also, perhaps with the support of Chile, uh, for uh, for uh, a, 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 a Latin American agreement uh, a, on a, a, on tax cooperation uh, of, uh, that they can uh, make things uh, uh, better. I think I'll stop here. Yeah. That's great with the time, by the way. <laughs> um, and the secretary Sanreza, uh, I would like to know uh, Chile. Oh, I'm really sorry. Uh, I'd like to know, Chile is following a similar path as Colombia. Um, you are uh, trying to do a um, very ambitious uh, reform as well. Uh, your plan is to change almost the whole tax structure. Uh, um, wouldn't it be easier to change only two or three kind of taxes? That's the right path to do, to try to change the whole system? Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, for us, as well as uh, in the case of Colombia, it is important to have a tax reform because we have a commitment uh, for fiscal consolidation. So public spending depends on permanent income, not on current income. And if you uh, have, and we, have to face uh, social demands uh, for social policy, we need to increase permanent income for the state. And the way to do that is to, through a tax reform. So we have called uh, the country for a tax and fiscal new deal. 
We have invited the communities, uh, the experts, and all uh, political sector to agree uh, for this uh, tax and fiscal new deal, which is more permanent income through taxes and progressivity in the tax system, and uh, fiscal consolidate, consolidate. It's the responsible way to make that happen. Okay? And the tax reform uh, faces uh, things that are uh, very, uh, very uh, relevant for the Chilean uh, reality. We have a, a, f a tax system which is uh, regressive. The top 1% uh, of the distribution pay less taxes with respect to their income than the whole distribution. And also, um, we have some uh, issues in the tax system that make income from capital uh, not very effective in terms of taxes. Okay, so we have a tax rate which is similar to OECD, but the effective tax rate over income from capital is very low with respect to OECD average. In fact, for example, undistributed profits in Chile don't pay taxes. So usually what companies does is to, uh, to have undistributed profits to another society that belongs to the same company, indefinitely. So uh, undistributed profits don't pay actually taxes. Um, so in that sense, this, the tax system uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't tax uh, income from capital. And the OCD has recommended uh, or, or has said it is desirable to have a wealth tax if you have an income tax uh, that doesn't uh, actually uh, is, is not very effective taxing income from capital. That's why we have developed uh, and proposed a wealth tax. In, in, a, in a sense that is complementary to the income tax. Yeah? And it allows us uh, to tax uh, wealth transfers, uh, to tax capital income, and to make the tax system more uh, progressive. Um, we are also doing a, a, a tax reform that includes uh, the decreasing the evasion and avoidance in the tax system. Actually, this is the main uh, source of income uh, in the expectation of the tax reform. And also, we have a reform on the royalty from copper and uh, corrupt taxes, uh, green taxes, and health taxes as well. So it's a, it's a reform that changes, uh, I wouldn't say the whole structure of the tax system, but introduces some new elements that make the system more progressive and uh, allow us to have enough uh, revenues to fill the gap that we have with respect to OECD countries. It, at this moment, Chile has a 7.8% of the GDP gap in tax revenue with respect to OECD average. And Chile is a, is a high income country. And uh, so we need to be forward uh, to fill that gap. And uh, we are not introducing so many changes in instrument, uh, not even uh, increasing in, in so many taxes, but to make the system more efficient in collecting uh, those taxes. Uh, we are having a lot of uh, changes in the authority tax uh, power to make that happen. Um, uh, and, and, and that is a big, uh, uh, is trans, uh, uh, all political parties are agree uh, that we shouldn't have, it's part of the fairness of the tax system to have a, a lower evasion and avoidance. And so in that sense, we think we are confident we are uh, making an effort uh, to have a better authority. Also, we have the technology today and nowadays internationally 
to have tax authorities that could have records, registers, and many more things that we didn't have uh, in the many years ago, half the century ago, as in in the case of Europe. So we think we could we could do better on that as well. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Uh, talk about the permanent, a, a system that is going to be permanent in the future for your income. So um, now I would like to talk with <laughs> Professor Stieglitz. Um, as co-chair of ICRIC, uh, we were talking about permanent taxes, but uh, you are trying now to convince governments to approve emergency taxes uh, that help countries to face this moment, this difficult moment, and to help the most vulnerable. Uh, first of all, I would like to have your opinion about uh, these two uh, tax reforms, and then uh, I would like you to explain uh, some uh, something about this um, emergency taxes that we you think we need right now. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Which button do we? Okay. Well, thank you. Um, well, first, let me say that uh, I think uh, both Colombia and Chile are moving in the right direction. I think they are really important uh, uh, tax reforms. Um, let me talk a little bit about uh, the context uh, that we're in. Um, for the last uh, quarter century, four decades, uh, the public sector has been starved, and uh, the the resources that are available for the public sector to make really high return investments in education, infrastructure, technology, uh, there haven't been the resources. So there is this long-term starving of the public sector, uh, not just in developing countries, but in developed countries. And you know, when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, we looked at the returns to further investment, particularly, say, in technology, and they were very, very high. So that's the first thing. And the second thing um, is that the tax structures that uh, we have today are not progressive and in some countries actually regressive. Uh, as mentioned, uh, the top, uh, at the top they pay a lower percentage, and it's not only true in Chile, it's true in the United States, it's true in many countries. And this causes a lot of societal harm, I think, resentment. Uh, it, it undermines, I think, our democracy, uh, our, our social solidarity, and it gives rise to uh, demagogues. So uh, that's the, the broad picture. Now, right now, we all know we're in a crisis of, of multiple, the pandemic, followed by the cost of living, the high uh, oil prices, um, uh, high food prices. Um, and uh, that uh, uh, presents both, you know, uh, 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 enormous stresses on our society, uh, uh, debt crises in many, many countries, but also huge distribution crises within the countries. So it's both a problem of the country as a whole, but also uh, 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 major redistributions. Uh, you take a country like the United States, where uh, we are. Uh, uh, neither an energy exporter or importer. We're roughly, uh, the oil companies have made off like bandits. A at the same time, consumers are paying enormous price uh, increases, uh, enormous stress. Norway is an energy exporter, and things are even worse there in that sense that the country as a whole is doing better, but consumers are facing even higher increases in their electricity bills. Uh, and really unsustainable. So uh, that highlights that uh, we need to do something. <laughs> something is not working. Um, what I worry about for developing countries and emerging markets, uh, when uh, they go to international organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the old recipes uh, will be imposed austerity. And we know what that will do, that will lower growth. I mean, recently, the IMF has been much better than it has. So I don't want to <laughs> castigate uh, the IMF from past uh, mistakes. But, uh, and I think they've learned that, you know, uh, 
Modern macroeconomics which says that when you have a major economic downturn, you need to stimulate, uh, stimulate the economy. I, those findings are uh, have been strengthened by what we saw in both 2008 crisis and the and in the uh, pandemic. But for emerging markets and developing countries, if they're going to have the ability to have the stimulus, particularly countries like Colombia and Chile that have a, a fiscal rule, but but in general, you know, uh, it's very hard for them to borrow. Um, uh, it's very important for them to have more fiscal space and the major way you can get fiscal space is more progressive taxation. Uh, the wealth tax uh, and uh, uh, making sure that the multinationals actually get taxed and windfall profits taxes. Um, let me make something uh, very clear from an economic perspective. Profits taxes are taxes on profits. I mean, that uh, sounds obvious, but uh, <laughs> They, you need to, you, you, almost all countries allow deductions of all expenses, uh, uh, labor and capital. Uh, capital is either deducted at the beginning, which many countries do, but over time through depreciation allowances. So a profit tax, a corporate income profits tax, uh, is non-distortionary. Uh, it does not adversely affect uh, investment, does not adversely affect uh, employment. Um, and, you know, there's some details that may matter, uh, you know, uh, 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 what allowances you have for, for losses. I, I don't want to, you know, these are very complex. But uh, 49 years ago, I wrote an article trying to explain all this and uh, to explain that uh, uh, they do not uh, reduce uh, corporate profits tax uh, if it's properly designed, does not reduce investment. Um, now, there is uh, one aspect where developing countries and emerging markets can suffer, and that is the race to the bottom in trying to attract capital. And that's where the OECD initiative uh, of a minimum tax uh, is a move in the right direction, and some countries, like the United States, have unilaterally imposed it. Not not a, the optimal design necessarily, but but uh, they have imposed it. But uh, now let me share with you some of uh, uh, ICRIC's views on uh, the OECD reforms. Um, our view on the minimum tax is uh, it's much too low. It should be 25, not 15. And the reason is, uh, if you remember, one of the reasons uh, many of us got engaged in this was that it was very clear that developing countries and emerging markets needed more revenue. And many of the countries have taxes at rates of 25% or more. What we're afraid of, and there's some evidence of this, that that 15% will be where everybody will center around, and that will lower the tax revenue that you get from corporations. So rather than helping things, it could uh, hurt things. Um, that's just one example of where the OECD uh, went wrong. Uh, the other part, pillar one, which is the allocation of uh, what are called tax rights, uh, really reflects uh, the problem that uh, Jose Antonio referred to uh, this was an agreement done mostly by the advanced countries. You know, it's called the inclusive framework. Everybody was around the table, uh, but uh, most of the people had their microphones permanently turned off. And uh, so uh, they could sit there and enjoy hearing other people, but the framework was really set by the developed countries. And, and when you look at where the... Re revenues are going, w how much extra revenues are going to be going to developing countries, uh, it's not very, uh, not very much. And there are a lot of details, uh, Jose Antonio mentioned the carve-outs, um, but uh, uh, the bottom line is that that agreement was uh, not an agreement that you, w if everybody's voices were there, 
uh, it would not be the agreement, and that's why uh, there's a feeling in ICRIC that that the governance of tax reform ought to be moved to uh, or ought to be reformed, and reformed in a way that uh, gives a voice to all the countries. And we have two international organizations that are designed to do that: the UN and the IMF. And uh, you know th that's where countries are represented. The OECD was created, I mean, I don't want to criticize it, I've been very active in the OECD, but it was created as an or, a, a club of the advanced countries. And, you know, it's, ref, it's brought others in, but not, uh, uh, if you look at the outcome, you would say, uh, what I said before, the, their microphones uh, were, were uh, turned off. So it's a step forward, but it's not uh, uh, enough of a step forward. Uh, I think Oxfam uh, uh, thinks to. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Gabriela Butcher. I think o Oxfam uh, thinks that uh, some of these proposals, like the OCD, are uh, are being insufficient, and um, the response, the government's response of the pandemic, uh, is been insuffic insufficient too, and the poverty in the world has increased. So what would be the response in your opinion at this moment? Thank you, and I'd like to start by saying it's so important that we're here today having this dialogue about uh, wealth taxation and taxation in general, and here at the IMF, it's long overdue and, and really important that, that we do this. And it's so good to hear um, committed governments such as Chile and Colombia speaking about their, their intentions to really reform the tax system and to, <laughs> thanks and to um, invite others, as uh, Minister Ocampo was saying, across Latin America. And I do hope that beyond, we start talking about this um, as, a, as a real alternative, a possibility for raising resources um, that are very needed. And, and we know that inequality is really at the root of many of the problems of the world. And many of the problems of the world that we are seeing are compounded by inequality that uh, is at the moment at such extreme levels. And we heard it, many of us outside today in the protesters on the streets, uh, really speaking about um, the, the issues with debt, climate, everything that is, is really threatening people, uh, people's lives across the world. So this is about um, wealth distribution and differences in, in terms of wealth and poverty, but it's also very much about um, who gets health care, and you were saying um, public services have been starved, so what does that mean? It means um, very different life expectancies, 10-year difference between one block and another in extremely unequal cities and, of course, in countries as well. So it gets to decide who lives and who doesn't, and who gets education and who doesn't, and who has social protection, land, food, and also a voice. This issue of the uh, microphones that are not there at the big tables is also something that is happening across the world in terms of who gets to, to decide and who gets to be at the table in terms of, of what is important. So this extreme inequality is also the systemic accumulation not only of wealth but also of power. And, and that power of the 1% um, that is, um, has been so systematically accumulated is done also by the denial of the power for the others. And there's no no uh, surprise that uh, wealth taxation is not spoken about so much because it's in fact not um, an, an issue that is uh, so much in the interest of those who are in the interest of maintaining a status quo of, of some privilege that has been acquired over time. So we see that uh, today the, the effects of inequality are multiplied uh, not only with the pandemic, uh, of course the, the war in Ukraine and the cost of living crisis and, and they're really fueling um, a very extreme situation. Some months ago, uh, Oxfam produced a report called Inequality Kills and showing how there's a correlation between extreme inequality and, as I was saying earlier, how, much, how many people actually uh, get to uh, live or die. And in Latin America, the pandemic hit harder um, than any other region in the world, both in terms of per capita deaths and also in economic contraction. And Latin America was already the most unequal region in the world before the virus struck. So there is there, um, some clue in, in what happened. And recently, the World Bank has said that the long-standing goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030 is unlikely to be met. 
And if we factor this worsening inequality, millions more people will be forced into extreme poverty just this year. And Latin America, unfortunately, has seen the reversal of the trend where gradually there was poverty reduction and greater equality, um, which started 20 years ago. That, unfortunately, is no longer the case. So what we have seen is an explosion of uh, record-breaking increases in the numbers and wealth of the richest people. So we have 573 people who became new billionaires during the pandemic <laughs> at a rate of uh, one every 30 hours uh, during the two years of the pandemic, and in Latin America, one every month. And so we, we see this with enormous uh, concern, and with our partners, Development Finance International, we published this week um, our Commitment to Reducing Inequality Index. Uh, which shows that the majority of governments actually added fuel to this already uh, critical state of inequality. And um, instead of adopting policies that would have reduced and, and responded to people's needs uh, in the majority of cases, they didn't do much in that respect. So there's, um, you know, 85% of governments uh, decided not, not to increase tax on, on the riches during the pandemic, and 11 actually reduced them during that time, therefore giving themselves less uh, resources to respond. And at the same time, half of low and middle income countries reduced their share of health spending with the consequences in the middle of a pandemic. So our CRI also shows that inequality is definitely a policy choice and it doesn't have to be that way. And there's some countries in our index that show another direction like Nepal that increased uh, doubled their spending on, on health or Costa Rica and New Zealand that increased taxation from uh, those that have the, the highest income brackets. So we think uh, it's definitely a time to look at redistributing because we have such extremes that are at the moment um, uh, without um, caps or reins and, and we need to see how they are uh, put at the service of uh, saving lives in the immediate because we have a, a crisis in terms of hundreds of millions um, in, in extreme hunger at the moment and in all sorts of situations, even in, in rich countries. And how we see that money being invested to reduce inequality in, and investing it in universal health care, um, in education, social protection, and also ensuring that the lives of women are transformed because there's also a very big gender dimension in this inequality and, and the accumulation of wealth has a more of a male face and, and the, the poverty is more of a, of a female face. And, but we want to go further and think, how can we design a system that is, a, is different? We don't have to be correcting after the event, but rather think of how it is fairer, fairer in the first place. And that perhaps in Latin America, we can be proud of societies that are looking out for everybody and that we're not missing out on the talents of people who are completely uh, not able to develop because of the lack of opportunity and the lack of basic access to services, which is the case at the moment. So, and the fact that they have no voice because of all these compounding inequalities is something that also needs to change. So we hope that with this process, we, we start creating jointly um, a society that, that is for everybody and a much more democratic society, as uh, Professor Stiglitz was saying, this is the path to doing that, to hearing everybody's voice and, and to really creating together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriela. So, Ilan Goldfan, uh, I know that there have been a lot of opinions right uh, on the table. I would like to know first, what do you think, what the IMF think of, uh, about these two brave uh, fiscal reforms? What do you think about uh, the, the way they are trying to change the, the structure, the tax structure to to get more revenues, uh, they are compromised. They also, both of them told they are compromised with fiscal consolidation. I know that's something that worries you. <laughs> so I would like to know, first of all, about uh, these two uh, tax reforms. And do you think, like Professor Stiglitz, that they are going in the right direction? And I would like to know so um, about what Gabriela uh, talked about, the increase of poverty in the region, uh, is this kind of measures the, the way to fight against this poverty? Thank you. First, uh, I would like to, to thank uh, 
everybody to be in person finally, and also finally debating these issues which are very good. So uh, we have here Gabriela, Claudia, Minister Ocampo, Professor Stiglitz, Patricia moderating. I'm very happy to be here with all of you. Um, I will I will try to to I'll, describe a little bit the view we have on this. But before I do it, let me just answer directly your question. Yes, we do think these reforms are in the right direction and in the direction we believe. And, and, and why is that? Uh, we are now under the third shock. We had the pandemic. Uh, we had the, uh, the Russia invasion of Ukraine. Uh, all very serious in terms of uh, hitting the population, on poverty, inequalities. And now we are starting to have the third shock in first shock from the point of view of the uh, developing economy, which is tightening of financial conditions that will probably decelerate the economies and will have an impact. So pretty important, but before we had these shocks, we had pre-existing challenges. I mean, in Latin America, we are talking about lost decades for quite some time. So basically because there's no growth. We also know that we, had, we have debt issues, public finances, and if you, you don't have the finance, how can you finance good services? How can you provide services if you're, you don't have the resources? And finally, the third one is economic inequality, disparities. And not surprisingly, you need to find a solution for the three of them and we don't have time, as in the past, to say, well, let's just grow and then think about inequalities or let's just, I mean, we will have to <coughs> deal with them simultaneously. We will have to have uh, inclusive reforms, fiscal reform, like these tax reforms, that we, at the same time, they bring more revenues so that they can provide more services or more resources to where the societies are asking. It is no coincidence we're talking about here, Chile and Colombia, that we heard the societies talking very loudly in both cases, yeah. democratically for elections, also on the streets. They're asking that. So uh, if we want to be sustainable, and we think about sustainable in terms of fiscal, but we need to be social sustainable at the same time. So both of them have to occur at the same time. Let me tell you how uh, are our status facts in terms of revenues, because at the end of the day, the, the title here is about taxation, and those are two tax reforms. So where are we in terms of revenue mobilization? And just to, to give a general principle, why do we need revenue mobilization? Because you need to secure sufficient resources to provide social support to the most vulnerable, especially now we've got a shock of energy and food, so you need to protect the most vulnerable. But you need to provide public goods uh, to do what you need to do. And the pandemic, and I think Gabriela mentioned it, the pandemic, it was a case where in Latin America we saw that there was lack of public services in a very uh, explicit way, and it became clear that we do need to provide this public good. So revenue mobilization is very important. How are we doing in terms of revenue mobilization in the region? Where, where, the, where the money is coming? Three, value-added tax, corporate tax, and personal income tax. Value-added tax is by far the largest way to mobilize. Then you have corporate income tax, where you have quite a bit of exemptions and loopholes, and that needs to, uh, when you have a reform, you have to look at that. Second, the issue of the global minimum tax and the race to the bottom that Professor Stiglitz, that's very, very important. And I'm not gonna talk more about corporate tax because I'm, I'm a decided Professor Stiglitz who has written quite a bit on that, so I will let you know. But in general, the region has corporate income tax, quite a bit of exemptions, loopholes, and the risks of race to the bottom, which means give exemptions and exemptions because you want to attract 
corporation. And finally, personal income tax. And this is where the revenues compared to OECD are very different. Just to give you the numbers, we have in personal income tax 10% of total uh, revenues compared to 25% in OECD. Uh, why? First, informality. So the region, if it's not one of the worst in informality, is there with other uh, poor. So informality, you cannot get personal income. But in addition to that, you do have other issues. First, uh, high thresholds, which means that sometimes to really pay, uh, you, the, the high rates are really, really high. So only few rich people end up paying. Tax are in general really low and increase very slowly the income level. So not really progressive in some sense. Uh, and finally, there are a lot of deductions. And you may think, well, you have the deduction, that's good because you will look at the vulnerable, but at the end of the day, the deductions. Who benefits is who knows how to. So those are the issues where we actually are not getting uh, the money from the revenues from the personal income tax. And, and, and the reforms we are hearing here have made some uh, 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 proposals in each of the measures I mentioned. And, and finally, uh, one, one thing that uh, we are not talking here is about um, revenues that are more related to health, to the environment, that are issues that if you're gonna tax, uh, we do want it uh, to have another objective, which is uh, direct this, the uh, economy to a more healthy and more environmental friendly. So those are things that are in these reforms that are, it's clearly the objective that we're looking. So let me just conclude that in general, that we must recognize the public's frustration with inequality, especially after the pandemic and with the inflation rising. There's, we need to recognize there's a widespread distrust in government policies in the region. For this, we need that policymakers design tax policies that improve the prog progressivity of the tax system and protect the poor while fostering productivity growth and ensuring fiscal sustainability. You, you, you don't need to have fiscal responsibility to be able to do this. Um, such plans should be properly and carefully communicated to the public. Moreover, in countries where the perception and confidence that taxes are well spent uh, is low, tax reform will need to be accompanied with improvements in the quality and composition of public expenditure. So we should cannot forget expenditure part. Even though we are talking about tax reform, the expenditure side is very important. So, as I said in the middle, uh, with tax reform can only work if they are socially and politically sustainable. Thank you. You spoke about a term uh, called inclusive reforms. <laughs> inclusive for whom? Exactly, in, uh, at this moment. Uh. Inclusive, inclusive means more progressive, uh, better in terms of income distribution on one side. On the other side, look at poverty and the most vulnerable. Those are the ones that uh, you should target. So for example, in the, in the reaction to these shocks that we have, now the energy shock, uh, we have seen a lot of uh, actions by, by government, uh, the more targeted to the ones they need, the better. To Minister Campo, <laughs> so if you want to rebuttal some, some of the words that has been saying uh, till this moment, but uh, also I would like to ask you about um, the idea that I think it was you or, or, or one of you talked about the idea of an alliance in Latin America about taxes. Um, it, it would be a good idea to have an alliance to try to defend the extent these fiscal policies in the region. 
Well, I was really talking about a, a tax agreement, a strong tra a regional tax agreement uh, along, you know, developing uh, principles uh, similar to those of the OECD inclusive framework. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, one problem that uh, in in this world uh, all countries have uh, is the um, is the is the tax avoidance, not to say tax evasion. <laughs> Uh, uh, may be uh, uh, associated to international uh, uh, flows, uh, uh, the capacity that, that uh, any tax earner uh, has to, uh, you know, to move the, the headquarters uh, of, uh, of his business or his residence uh, in, in order to pay uh, lower uh, taxes uh, or no taxes. <laughs> uh, so that's a, a major problem, uh, and certainly in this region, I mean, Colombia, for example, uh, it has problems with uh, uh, at least one of his neighbors, uh, uh, but uh, uh, but also the Caribbean, uh, 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 the many Caribbean places um, uh, uh, which are tax havens, and, and uh, how, how to manage that is important. But even I must say, even moving uh, people who move to Florida, uh, in the case of Colombia, uh, is a major source of uh, of problems. Uh, and the, uh, how, uh, of course, it, in uh, uh, both in the U.S. and Colombia, we we we, we now have a system of uh, global income, uh, uh, which uh, is good, let's say. But uh, I'm not totally sure that uh, we're able, even under that system, to to avoid the, the some levels of tax avoidance. Uh, anyway, uh, by the way, uh, what the Vice Minister of Chile uh, mentioned uh, is. Quite, quite important because uh, aside from, I think the opportunities of, uh, of, uh, of the, let's say, the new technologies of uh, the data technology, let's say, uh, to try to track uh, where people are making uh, uh, their income, uh, is actually a significant advance. For example, this year in Colombia, for the first time, all taxpayers got a, a, a preliminary a tax, uh, uh, a tax uh, a bill from the government. <laughs> <laughs> so we got, uh, everyone said, but this were your, this were your incomes last year. Uh, uh, so we have to, uh, of course, take that into account in our tax return because that's the information that the tax administration has, which is arbitral. And, uh, and for example, a system uh, in which uh, all payments are digital, uh, which is, of course, all, uh, or most payments are, are digital, uh, is also a movement in the right direction because that will allow uh, the tax administration also, I mean, or among other reasons to, I mean, first of all, it may be easier for people to use, you know, just Brazil, for example, is well advanced, uh, probably the most advanced in Latin America in that regard. Uh, uh, so that, but for the tax administration, it's also a great benefit uh, to have information of who is uh, moving money, let's say, in, uh, for making payments. So all those things are, are also a possibility of uh, improving Improving the uh, the uh, uh, information uh, uh, that tax administrations have, so I, I think uh, you know moving into a regional agreement, uh, you know uh, supporting in a sense uh, the OECD negotiations or eventual UN negotiations, uh, I think uh, uh, will be a, a significant improvement. That's that's a point by the by the way that ICRID has emphasized in the past, and uh, and uh, as I I was also part of ICRID. Uh, well, I continue to be part of it, actually. <laughs> I have not resigned. <laughs> I am not the chair anymore. Uh, the Joe is now one of the co-chairs. But uh, I, 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 we, that's a point that we have emphasized uh, quite a bit. By the way, all the, also the wealth tax indirectly, uh, I mean, although the ICRI is more about corporate income, uh, uh, certainly the wealth tax, uh, and perhaps ICRI should move into more into personal income and wealth taxes a bit more. Talking about that, that, uh, that Oxfam has done a good job. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I was saying about the agreement about the uh, your president, uh, President Boric, uh, uh, has been calling for this kind of agreement to avoid uh, tax havens, or to, but. Uh, it's a hard moment for this kind of agreement in a in a moment that uh, maybe governments are trying to compete to lessen their taxes uh, in a way to get more revenues. Uh, do you think uh, it would be easy to try to find an agreement like this in the region? 
Um, I think it's, it is always a challenge to make a, an agreement that changes uh, the status quo. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but we have to make the effort to, to make that agreement, to have to work on that. And I think it's a, a, it's a, it's a moment to, to, to do it today. There are a lot of incentives to, uh, to actually compete with the tax systems, and that would be very bad for our countries as well. Uh, so we have to put in the balance uh, the benefits and costs uh, of this agreement today. Uh, Agreement means uh, to make an effort uh, for our tax uh, authorities, for our tax system, uh, to, uh, to respect some uh, of the main issues, which in, in our region are the ones uh, Ian told us, no? we need uh, inclusive growth. Uh, we need societies with less inequality, with more social cohesion, and that is not uh, free. Yeah? We, we have to invest on that ta kind of society, and to make that, uh, uh, the tax systems are uh, very relevant. So I think it's a moment uh, to make that effort. Uh, the possibility of the coordination is now, uh, before, uh, we try to compete uh, with the tax system. And we need tax cooperation and coordination. Uh, we have the technologies nowadays, as uh, Minister Ocampo said. Um, we can modernize, actually, our uh, tax authorities. We have been doing that in Chile as well, and improving uh, also, uh, the, the revenues through uh, diminishing informality, for example, in our societies. We can share experiences, good experiences. In, in many of our countries, have developed some incentives uh, that are working uh, to reduce informality, for example, which is also uh, something we care about in the Chilean tax reform. Um, I, I, would, I would like to also finish with this idea that <clears throat> uh, inclusivity in, the, in growth means also uh, to recognize that one peso or one dollar spent in the poorer is uh, more relevant in terms of welfare than one peso uh, invest in the richest. And that's why we need a uh, focus on the, our vulnerable people. Um, uh, <clears throat> that means uh, uh, recognizing uh, uh, inclusive, inclusivity in the growth. And, and finally, the, in the Chilean case, the, the data uh, that uh, Ian also told us about is a, a structure of the tax system that is very particular to Latin America in Chile is even maybe worse. Personal uh, income tax is very low in the tax structure. That's why we also are focusing uh, on that in, in the reform, as well as uh, uh, tax avoidance. <laughs> okay, uh, and 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 uh, and we have uh, actually we have a a, a big threshold threshold. I mean, we have a lot of people, low-income people in general, that are not uh, paying, actually, uh, income tax. Um, but we also uh, have a, a tax uh, rate, marginal tax rate, that could improve in terms of progressivity. So, <clears throat> actually, uh, the reform in terms of the income taxes uh, from labor are a focus on the three percent of the co of the most uh, uh, of the of the people who, uh, with most uh, more income. Okay, um, and deductions. Deductions is uh, is a very important issue in Chile. 
Uh, we had uh, actually uh, a big um, panel of experts uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and there was like a very broad agreement to reduce, reduce these deductions. However, uh, it's difficult to, to make that. There are, for some reason, they are there. And so if something could uh, help us as well in that is to have this principle. What are the principles for deductions? I think some countries have uh, developed I think the IMF could also maybe have some principles to organize um, uh, these deductions, and, and we, can, we can advance on that as well in the region, I think. Professor Stiglitz, are the countries doing enough to finish with these deductions that uh, are a problem to <laughs> to get more revenues, the whole deductions that more companies have, and at the end, they don't pay uh, enough taxes. Do you think he, it's, he's been doing enough about this? Uh, no, they haven't. Uh, and, but this is a global problem, not only developing in emerging markets. Uh, it was an issue I struggled with the, in the United States uh, when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. It was, uh, and the, I mean, the, the answer of why is pretty clear. Uh, you talk about uh, deductions of uh, 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 interest on uh, homes, uh, the real estate sector, and the finance sector. Uh, you have two important sectors who like these because uh, they encourage people to buy uh, bigger homes, the real estate loves that, and finance sector wants people to finance it by debt. Uh, they like that. Bad for the, both of them are probably bad for the economy uh, at some point. I mean, it, 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 we saw in 2008, uh, they really had pushed uh, finance, debt finance way too, way too far. So um, we, we sort of under, understand why it's so difficult. Um, one of the uh, arguments that we made uh, we made is that actually, if you broaden the base, uh, you can get the same revenue at a lower rate. And uh, here is where I, uh, I had a proposal never got very far, um, which was actually uh, there are big advantages for low income for for collecting the revenue from what ordinary individuals through the VAT. It's sort of like a flat rate on everybody. Uh, and uh, it can have even some degree of progressivity if you have an exemption for food. The, in most countries, the complexity of the tax system is such that uh, it is so much easier to collect it through a VAT than to have people have to fill out tax forms. And that's the advantage. I, I, I was arguing that actually the threshold should be very high and the bottom part actually collected effect de facto through the VAT. And uh, the income tax should be then reserved for the upper half of, uh, of, the, of the population. Now, that particular view I think uh, can be changed, and I was doing this before the arrival of digitalization. <laughs> uh, uh, what uh, Colombia is doing uh, is what I think most countries who have the capacity should be doing, which is uh, sending people a bill, giving them a chance to say, is this right or wrong, uh, not imposing huge administrative costs, the interesting thing is that there is a uh, there was a move in the United States, and if you who opposed it, uh, Intuit, which is the owner of uh, TurboTax, and HR Block, so they like the privatization of suffering. Uh, they like the fact that everybody in our country has to pay, in the United States has to pay large amounts of money to have their taxes fill uh, 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 paid. 
And that really undermines support for public services. I mean, it's sort of a double insult. You have to pay in order to pay your taxes. And that, to me, seems a wrong framework. So I think one of the things that uh, the IMF should encourage is for those countries that have the, the capacity, uh, have the kind of thing that Columbia is moving uh, towards, where you get a tax bill. And that would have a double benefit, because I think the digitalization of government can help in transparency. Uh, it, it, it can uh, increase the efficiency and confidence in the public sector. So if you can move, for those countries that can move in that, they should be moving uh, rapidly. I would like to uh, pick with you, uh, Professor, because of the windfall uh, profit taxes is, is <laughs> an, uh, an initiative that you defend. And uh, I think uh, in, this, in these meetings this week uh, in Washington, it's been discussing a lot about uh, how we can uh, get more revenues, and the windfall taxes uh, are in the, in the conversation all the time. So I don't know if you have convinced most people <laughs> here in this, here this week about the windfall taxes. Well, I've been working a long time to try to convince, <laughs> for instance, uh, the U.S. administration. I have to admit, failure uh, so far. Uh, let me begin by, again, talking a little bit about the context. Uh, we have these high uh, prices, oil, food, uh, inflation. Uh, the Fed's raising the interest rates is not going to solve the problem. We should be clear about that. It's not going to create more food. It's not going to create more oil. Uh, it will create more problems for the developing countries. It's an example of what I call the 21st century version of beggar thy neighbor policies because we raise interest rates to reduce inflation here. It increases uh, uh, the exchange rate uh, in other countries. It, it means they face more inflationary uh, pressure, and it creates a debt crisis. And so these external effects of U.S. monetary policies remind me a little bit of what happened in the 1980s, where we had uh, the debt crisis, uh, Latin American debt crisis, caused by Volcker's raising the interest rates. He was warned by one of the members of his board that that would cause a global, uh, a Latin American financial crisis, you know, given the, the high level of debt. And we've been through 14 years of close to zero interest rates, so not a surprise that there's a high level of debt, both at the corporate, household, and country uh, level. And he says, that's not my problem. Uh, the, my, my mandate is U.S. economy. And uh, there is that kind of provinciality, you might say. In a world globalization, that has severe, serious problems. So I, I think what we are going to be seeing is these high interest rates are going to have a very limited effect on inflation. And, uh, I've done an analysis of the extent to which inflation in the U.S. is caused by demand. Uh, aggregate demand, real aggregate demand, is actually a below trend, uh, contrary to a few people who argue that all that government spending uh, in the pandemic uh, caused our, is the source of the inflation. Overwhelming evidence that that is wrong. And it's a supply side disturbance, relative sectors. Uh, um, but that. The, the answer is fiscal measures, uh, more investment in energy, like green energy, which is, again, one of the topics that's being discussed, um, more investment in agriculture, rural roads, so that uh, people can get their, their, their goods to market. So there are lots of things you could do on the supply side that are going to be effective in dealing with uh, uh, inflation. But the large changes in relative prices that we're seeing, oil, food, give rise to huge windfall <laughs> profits taxes. And I, I mentioned in my previous comments that a well-designed corporate profits tax does not discourage investment, employment. It, it's non-distortionary. And that's even more true for windfall profits taxes. 
And Wimple Profits taxes are easy to design. The statement that works very hard. How do you know what is a Wimple? That's wrong. We know how much prices are above normal levels. And so we can, we can talk about, you know, you, there are way, different thresholds you can have, but we know how to design a, a windfall profits tax uh, that really does capture windfall profits. And those revenues, as all of us have been talking about, are absolutely essential for addressing the multiple crises uh, that uh, you talked about, that we talked about before. And, and, and there's really uh, no alternative in my mind. Uh, it is the lowest hanging fruits it has a lot of money, unfor unfortunately, because large changes in relative prices are stressful for the economy. Uh, we, we don't have as resilient economy as we had hoped, and therefore the stresses are greater than we had hoped. And finally, let me just say one of the ironies of all of this is that because we underinvested in resilience, price increases are even higher than they would have been if we had a more resilient sector. And so some of the sectors that did not invest in resilience, more capacity, are benefiting even more from the crisis. So they, you know, the, they're being rewarded for their failure to be resilient. Finally, the evidence is also very strong in the United States. I, I haven't looked at it in other countries that uh, there are huge increases in margins, and at least some of this is due to market power, oligopoly. There's been a growth of oligopolies, monopoly power. We know it in digital sectors, but we know it in, in many other sectors of the economy. And so there's even a more compelling case for, your, for the windfall profits tax because some of it is the, the exercise of, of market power. I'm really sorry. I think we are uh, running out of time. So uh, <coughs> just if you, some of you have a, a question, some of the audience, uh, it should be uh, uh, formulated from one of these two microphones because uh, we need a microphone to do the questions. But only, uh, and, and uh, I, s I know that Gabriela <laughs> and Ilan didn't talk again. So if if someone wants to someone wants to make a, a question for them, uh, that would be great. If you, if you don't, I have. I the mean, from my point okay. of view, they can ask questions to anybody. <laughs> Uh, ready. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, it's a pleasure to address you, sir, really. Um, I, um, I grew up in Colombia half of my life, and also the other half here in the U.S. Um, so uh, it's not actually a question. It's to see your views on, how, uh, on the need of educating the population, the citizens, to understand the policies that they're being imposed to. Uh, meaning, you know, we can talk about macro, micro policies, but the common citizen do not understand that. So what is, the, what is your view on how to do better in, 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 in making it simple, a simple language so individuals can understand and not to and not have reactions like we've seen in Colombia lately. Thank you. Okay, very very brief answer, uh, it, which is uh, this is something that uh, all of our institutions have to work on. I mean, you know, the uh, the the internet multinational multilateral institutions. Uh, Academia needs to play an important role. I think civil society, institutions like Oxfam, play a very important role. You know, the, the report that, there, that uh, she mentioned about inequality kills, uh, that title conveys a lot. And, you know, there are statistics that support it, but that simple message, I think, 
uh, is one that people ought to uh, understand and, and can understand. And, and the pandemic, one, uh, one more thing maybe I'll say, which is one always needs to use teaching moments. The pandemic was a teaching moment where we got to see clearly the evidence of inequality. People understood it. They were focused on it. And, you know, as teachers, we always try to think about, you know, examples that bring things home. And as uh, when there are these teaching moments, the financial crisis, uh, we have to take advantage of those to, to try to convey as much as we can about what is going on. <coughs> Sorry, Gabriela. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to ask actually a question of Mr. Goldstein, um, because I heard you speaking about um, different taxes, VAT, corporate, and also personal income tax, and the issue that you know Latin America has such large informal sector. Um, but I'd like you to hear from you on, on your views on wealth taxation, because that's some of the interesting new elements of the reforms in Chile and Colombia. And a second question is around, uh, so we heard the IMF, uh, for example, criticizing and the UK government's uh, this proposals to reduce high income bracket taxes and you know saying literally this will increase inequality and we agree and you know that's a, a statement that that is important so I, I, I'd like to hear how this relates to the country level work because our partners and ourselves we see that the majority of loans and 87 percent of loans that were made during the pandemic actually include austerity measures which are contrary to these views of uh, reducing inequality so how does this rhetoric and these ideas uh, really channel into country-level work that impacts people's lives? So uh, my, my view is, uh, is different regarding your assumption. Your assumption that uh, fighting inequalities and have fixed responsibility cannot be together. And I think they need to be. Uh, and the way to do it, I mean, that we just have tax reforms that are progressive. Uh, on the expenditure side, you need to focus in the most vulnerable. So we need to be able to talk the same language. So instead of talking austerity, we just we, we say uh, you need to be able to finance it. You need to be able to have fiscal responsibility. At the same time, yet you uh, look for inclusiveness. You ask me about wealth. Uh, wealth tax. There are several ways, several uh, types of wealth. Some work better than others. Property taxes, inheriting tax, uh, maybe those are, have a, a better, more efficient way of actually uh, getting revenue mobilization. The issue with wealth is not an issue in principle. It's more an issue in practice. Are you able to get the revenues you uh, you want to because of all this avoidance that we talk about or the capacity to, to move. So it's not a principle issue, it's a matter of how do you actually get the revenues. And, and, and the amount of revenues you get is very important to be able to do what you want to do. So and if you don't get the revenues, it will be very difficult to, 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 to spend it. Can I just say one thing about why I think a, a wealth tax is a good idea? Um, which uh, really <laughs> echoes uh, what uh, the minister from Chile uh, said, which, and it complements what you said about uh, implementation. Um, unfortunately, uh, all of our income taxes are imperfect. There's a lot of uh, that escapes. And all of our inheritance taxes, many countries don't have inheritance taxes, but even those that do, uh, they're imperfect, and a lot of, of, of money escapes. And a wealth tax that is directed at the very top, at the very rich, uh, is a way of supplementing these other taxes, capturing money that would has otherwise escaped. You know, one half a percent, one percent, one and a half percent is not going to get raised at, at the at, at people at the very top. It's not going to give rise to a lot of distortions. It's a limited number of people, actually. You can identify the number of people. Much of their wealth is in financial wealth, in property, in identifiable assets. Some of it you're not going to get. It's not going to be perfect. But you have to think of this as two imperfects is better than one. 
and you look at it systemically. Yeah. May I? Can I just? I am. I know we're out of time, but I just yeah. want to. I know. They, they very told hard, me very I have to finish, but. <laughs> yeah, the, May I ask a, a last question? Just, sir? just to compliment this. A lot of our tax view is how imperfect they are and how we. Do. But one thing you mentioned, I think, is very important. Digitalization will make things much easier. And I think we are going in that direction because yeah. the, the capacity to evade will disappear as fast as digitalization can come. That's all. Yeah. A no, last I, question I, may I ask? Let me just Paul, say, Paul. underscore one issue that actually, uh, <laughs> first of all, on the progressive character of the wealth tax, that's one point. But also uh, to complement uh, uh, Joe's comments, uh, uh, the Colombia created the wealth tax in 1936. We had a wealth tax from 1936 to 1989, and several ones actually in the 21st century. So we have a long tradition. And the, when it was created, one of the reasons why it was created because they said that the income tax, capital income, is always underestimated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the wealth tax is a complement. That was the historical origin of the, for the uh, uh, reason for the wealth tax. All right, Mr. Thank Buffon, you very much for, to everybody. I'm really sorry I didn't calculate the time well. So. But now we have to finish. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And Thank you.